Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 7th, 2014, and I want to once again remind listeners to visit our archives at econtalk.org. Just go to the left-hand margin, click on date, and send me a list of your five favorite episodes of 2013. Send them to me at mail at econtalk.org and put favorites in the subject line. I'll be closing the voting at the end of the month and letting you know later on which episodes uh, got the most votes. My guest today is Jonathan Haidt. He is a professor at New York University's Stern School of Business. His latest book is The Righteous Mind, which is the subject of today's conversation. Jonathan, welcome to Econ Talk. Oh, thanks, Russ. Pleasure to be here. I have to say at the beginning that The Righteous Mind is one of the most interesting books I've read in the last 10 years. I do worry that my assessment is biased. It deals with a host of issues that come up regularly here on Econ Talk, in particular the limits of reason as well as issues that I'm grappling with as I work on a book on uh, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. So my rave review may not apply very well for you listening out there, but it might. So um, let's get into it. Uh, Jonathan, early in your book, you ask how children come to know right from wrong. Where does morality come from? What's your answer? Uh, My answer is that um, we are products of evolution like everything else, and when we have certain stuff built into us that helps us navigate the social world, that's the first part of the story. Um, But nothing is hardwired. Um, Evolution in people is quite flexible. Uh, And the second part of the story is is culture shapes us to develop certain capacities more than others. Um, So when I was first in grad school, uh, the general answers were, oh, kids figure it out for themselves, is what Lawrence Kohlberg said. Um, Or anthropologists said, oh, kids internalize it from the grownups in their culture. Uh, But I really went to third way, which is a kind of a modified nativist view. It starts with uh, what's innate, and then uh, you look at how it develops within a cultural context. So explain uh, what you mean by nativist and what you mean by innate. So in the social sciences, one of the big controversial areas, really for a couple hundred years, is um, is human nature uh, innate? Um, is there human nature even? Steve Pinker uh, wrote a book called The Blank Slate, arguing against the prevailing notion, it's most common on the political left, that there is no human nature, that um, people are flexible, malleable, uh, we can raise kids to turn out however we want. That's the extreme view of the um, of what's sometimes called the empiricist position, which is everything's a product of experience. Uh, at the other extreme is the extreme nativist view, uh, which is to say that our, our behavior, our personality, uh, all that is as innate as our uh, eye color and our hair color. After all, everything's heritable. So that's the big debate in the social sciences, and, and I've come down fairly firmly uh, on the nativist side, as long as you uh, admit that or grant that uh, culture and flexibility is part of our uh, um, evolutionary endowment. And you say often uh, – you have a number of different metaphors, but I like uh, – at one point you say we are predisposed but not predestined in various ways. But you have other ways of talking about it. That's right. The best definition of, of innate that I've ever found, which I think just cuts through all, uh, all the confusion, is from my colleague here at NYU, Gary Marcus, um, who says that innate just means structured in advance of experience, but then experience can revise it. And, uh, you know, if you look at the way kids uh, come out all over the world, um, they tend to kind of know that if someone hits you, you hit them back. You don't have to teach that. Now, you can try to teach them to love their neighbor and to turn the other cheek, and maybe you'll have a little bit of success. Uh, But we're structured in advance of experience to think in terms of reciprocity. If someone's nice to me, I'll be nice to him. If, If someone does something mean to me, I'll do something mean to her. Um, so that's what I mean by structured in advance of experience, but still flexible afterwards. Now you say we're born to be righteous, and you also yeah, claim absolutely. you also claim that children not only are they are they prone to hit back, but they are prone to be favorable toward kind people and kind even physical objects in puppet shows and other and other types of representations, yeah, and not yeah, sympathetic, so yeah. not empathetic with with cruel. Uh, suggesting that 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 harm is a as a moral principle, an opposition to harming others, 
is deeply embedded in us. Uh, talk a little bit about how that could possibly be known. And I'm a little bit skeptical about it. I'm sympathetic to the idea, but I'm skeptical about uh-huh. the, the findings. Okay. Um, well, so my general approach is called moral foundations theory, the idea that there are multiple foundations. Just, to be, just as we have multiple taste buds on our tongue, because you know, we don't just have one taste receptor that guides us to delicious food. We have taste receptors that guide us to fruit and other receptors that guide us to meat, you know, sweet and sour on the one hand and umami or or, or glutamate uh, and salt on the other. Um, And in the same way in our social lives, uh, we have to figure out who, who should I cooperate with? Who should I trust? Who should I marry? Who should I um, uh, partner with? And so we've got all these moral taste buds, you might say, and one of the most basic is who is nice and who, versus who's cruel. People vary a lot on this. And so, um, so I was working on, on this theory over the last eight or 10 years. And while I was doing that, there was this amazing work coming out of Yale, coming out of Paul Bloom and Karen Wynn, uh, their lab, uh, their developmental lab at Yale where they study children. And what they found is that when you take kids as young as three or four months and you show them a puppet show with these wooden puppets they made in which one of the puppets is struggling to get up a hill and the other puppet either seems to come up behind it and help it, help push it up to the top. Or you take the same puppet who starts from the top and he comes down and he smashes into him from above and blocks him and pushes him down. So even three months old seem to detect that this is a story about helping or about hindering. And then after they see that story, you put the two puppets on a tray and you look at which one they look at or when they're a little older, which one they reach for. And what you find is that as young as three months, and it's very clear by six months, um, the kids like the puppet that was helping, and they don't like the puppet that was hindering. And so th- there are a lot of results like this that show that, um, that kids are real, just as kids are picking up what's sweet. You know, they like what's sweet. They don't like what's, what's sour or bitter. They're picking up what's nice, sort of morally sweet, you might say. What's you remember what um, again? I'm a little skeptical of that kind of finding. It's because it's so part of the reason I'm skeptical is it, it's so cool. A three month old <laughs> has has is hardwired to be kind. So one question I'd ask is, and maybe you don't know this off the top of your head. Apologize if you don't. But how statistically different? Not significant, but what's the magnitude mm-hmm. of the difference? Is it eighty percent of the time the kids pick up the nice puppet, or is it fifty three percent of the time versus the mean puppet? Yeah, I don't have those numbers handy, but I'm pretty sure it's in between. So um, these studies tend to not use large sample size. So your question is very germane when you have large sample sizes. Sometimes you can have, uh, you know, 52% of Republicans, but only 48% of Democrats do something in a sample of, you know, 10,000 people. And that's statistically significant, but it's, it's so small that we don't really care about it. Um, these studies are, are a little harder to do. They tend to just use like 15 or 20 subjects per cell. Um, and my recollection is that they're pretty robust. Um, and, uh, so it's not 80%. I mean, when you're dealing with little, little kids, there's a lot of noise in the data. It's not 80%, but it's also not just, it's not a tiny effect. Uh, lots of labs, um, get these effects. They've now getting them for even something about group loyalty or in-group out-group. Um, so I'm still, but I'm, I'm puzzled by your skepticism. Why would you be skeptical? Why would you think that kids are born blank slates, unable to distinguish between someone in their environment who is nice and warm and gentle versus someone who's cruel and tyrannical and violent? Well, for starters, because I, I have no problem with the idea that we might be hardwired to be that way. And I, 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 part of me, as I suspect part of many listeners would say, they'd like to believe that. I just when I when I think about that actual experiment, I worry about mm-hmm. what did reach for mean. I worry about does a three month old really know about what it means for a puppet to go up a hill? Does it really understand? I mean, th- there's a lot of things I I'm just not so sure about. But let's go. Let's go. Totally. Go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. We can move on. No, no. But go I was ahead. I going to say th- these findings build on some of the coolest studies in developmental psychology done in the 1980s by Rene Bayarjan, who showed that kids have an intuitive understanding of physics. So she's the one who developed this method where you show people like a car which seems to move through a solid block or in other case, the car is moving on a track behind the solid block. And she found that kids as young as three months, they stare longer at what looks like magic. And, you know, oh my God, well, if the blank slate is true, that, you know, this doesn't make sense because how could they have learned that? But if, if knowledge of physics is innate, well, then it makes perfect sense. Okay, now think how crazy it is to, to, to be surprised that knowledge of physics is innate. In horses, horses are born, 
they stand up on the first day and they move. They run, you know, they don't run into trees. I mean, a horse's brain is able to say, well, there's a tree. I can't go through it. Uh, why can't a baby's brain be born to understand that objects are solid and uh, objects can't pass through other solid objects? So, you know, the, the brain is very, very structured in advance of experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to that idea. And I, as I said, I'm more than open. I'd like the idea of it to some extent. Um, but I just think we should, you know, be a little bit skeptical of experimental results in general. And we'll get back to that. We'll come back to that, that later. That is true. <laughs> we'll there reason, there are reasons to be skeptical of experimental results. That is true. We have to be more skeptical than we have been. I agree with that. So we'll, we'll come back to that. But uh, you mentioned a, a key idea of your book in passing that I want you to, to talk about in some detail, which is that we have – moral receptors that are varied in the same way that we have taste receptors. And that's just a metaphor. So to to make that real and, yeah. and vigorous, you have, you have to talk about it in more detail. But to get us into that, I want you to talk about WEIRD. Now, WEIRD mm-hmm. is an acronym you use for Western, Educated, Industrial, Rich, Democratic Folk, folk who live in, mm-hmm. say, America. Uh, that's right. And you use – I don't know who wrote the, made the acronym, but the acronym points out that we're actually somewhat distinctive. Um, yes. Weird folk uh, like you and me. What's weird about us in the in terms of the scope of our morality? What is the range of moral uh, sensitivities that that you've discovered in your research and that of others? Sure. Um, so I began my research doing uh, looking into um, what I called harmless taboo violations. Uh, when I was a grad student, I was reading. I was trying to understand morality across cultures. And I read, the, I read the Old Testament, I read the Quran, I read a lot of religious texts, I read a lot of anthropology, I read a lot of accounts of, uh, of, of non-Western societies. And what struck me was that most of them care a great deal about purity and pollution. They have all kinds of elaborate rules for how to treat women who are menstruating and what to do with corpses and so much stuff about the body, which we think is just hygiene. You know, this isn't morality, this is hygiene. But we, it turns out, are the exceptions. Most cultures moralize the body. They think food has all kinds of moral properties and moral essences. Of course, sex is often heavily moralized. We do that too. Um, but my point is that there are, it's like morality is very thick in most parts of the world. And then for us, it's really thin. For us, we went through this historical process in the Enlightenment and, and both before and after of, of – of, it, rising individualism, rising individual liberty. You can't make. You can't tell me to not do something unless you can show that I'm hurting you, or or it's in some other way you have standing to say that I'm causing some harm to someone. But in most of the world, morality is thicker. It regulates all kinds of stuff. So anyway, so I'm doing that work um, in the 90s and, and the early 2000s. And at the same time, this team at the University of British Columbia, uh, led by Joe Henrik. Um, were, they were summarizing all the results they could find, including, including my research, on how it is that people from weird cultures, you know, Westerners like us, are different. And even in visual perception, that's what's so cool. It's even in visual perception. The general theme is we weirdos see a world full of individual objects. And most people see a world that's more of, of things that are more connected. Um, one nice example is if you if you look if you show people a picture of fish swimming, um, we weirdos focus on the lead fish. We think he's leading. People from East Asia they actually see and remember more about all the fish, and they actually notice the background. Americans don't can't remember the background because they didn't notice. They were just looking at the lead fish. So our minds work differently. We're more individualistic, and that leads to uh, us thinking in very different ways and behaving in different ways. So talk about the six uh, types of morality that you uh, you feel cover the spectrum given that, that it's mm-hmm. a wider spectrum outside the U.S. and the West. Yeah, so starting with the three that we all have, that everybody has and that we Americans all have. So we've already talked about issues of care versus harm. Um, that's That you find that everywhere. Then there's issues of fairness versus cheating. Now, you will never find a human society that doesn't care a lot about reciprocity, trading favors, uh, uh, vendettas, feuds, gratitude, exchange. So this also is a basic foundation of human sociality and of human morality everywhere. Um, Now, what we found is that liberals focus more on equality. Uh, By liberal, I just mean left. And uh, conservatives or the right, they focus more on proportionality, but they all think that they care about fairness. Third foundation is liberty versus oppression. Um, We're primates. We evolved in hierarchical primate groups. Um, We can do hierarchy, but we really resent a bullying alpha male. 
And uh, you see this, boy, do you see this on the Tea Party where the bullying uh, alpha male is the government. And it's, you know, harkens back to the American uh, Revolution and, and liberty, liberty, liberty. Well, you see it on the left, too, where uh, the bully is the corporations and the rich, and we need the government to protect us. So it's, there it's the same psychology, only a different villain. So those are the three that are easy, that are, uh, that are the heart of the American culture war now. Now we can move on to the three that are that are less common on the political left. Now, you still find them on the right, and you find them in almost all traditional societies, but those three are authority uh, versus subversion. Um, uh, so the idea that uh, um, people in power, or it's, it's especially clear, say, within the family, there are positions that where someone is deserving of respect, you shouldn't just the word backtalk, um, you know, a word that didn't – in my, uh, you know, sort of liberal Jewish family, there was no such thing as backtalk. Of course you talk back to anybody who tells you to do something if you disagree. You wouldn't uh, have a special term for it in other words. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah that's, that's right. But when I, when I began teaching at the University of Virginia, or actually when I lived in an African-American neighborhood in Philadelphia, and the kids would use words like backtalk, um, and the rural kids in Virginia would say that. You know, you don't talk back to grownups. So um, that's uh, the fourth foundation is authority. Uh, the fifth uh, is loyalty versus uh, betrayal. Um, and uh, here you find this uh, more, especially in working class families and uh, the, the idea that blood is thicker than water, um, that you owe things to people because you're members of the group. Um, um, and then the last one is sanctity versus, <clears throat> uh, versus degradation. Um, and this is, for example, the idea that the body is a temple. Um, on the left, there's more, <clears throat> I actually have bumper stickers in my book. Your body may be a temple, but mine's a playground. Um, the idea that th certain things are sacred, that we shouldn't take advantage of them, um, even if it, we would enjoy it and there's no harm. Um, and you see this especially in evangelical Christianity. It's all over the Quran, the Old Testament, uh, the idea of sacredness and sanctity and holiness and purity. And these issues are, you always find these. If you look at, at the older uh, cultural war uh, um, battles, like over drug use, um, abortion, euthanasia, any, any of these life and death issues. They're not really just about harm versus uh, choice. They're almost always uh, about some lingering notion of sanctity, uh, zones where we should not transgress. Now you said – I don't want listeners to get confused. You said the first three of those are uh, Western and the, the last three are more associated with traditional – cultures. But of course, as you point out well, just now – Well, the first now, three are universal. The first three uni everyone yeah. has. But the last three do exist in lots of places in America and, the, and, and in general you associate them with conservative politics. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. But since the people doing the scholarship are almost always secular liberals, um, they tend not to see that as part of the moral domain. If you look at the moral philosophy literature, um, there's almost – it's almost as though there's a prize for whoever can identify a single foundation of morality. So – the philosophy literature, which grows overwhelmingly out of uh, sort of liberal or leftist uh, thinking, leaving aside the Catholic tradition, that is, um, it's either you've got the utilitarians who say morality is all about harm. That's all it is. Everything's reducible to harm. Or you've got the Kantians and deontologists who say, no, no, it's all about rights and fairness and, and justice. Um, so, uh, so, yes, you do find all of the moral uh, foundations in the United States, but they're rather thin on the secular left, those, those last three. And I should mention that you are a member – you would probably classify yourself as a member of the secular left, correct? Um, well, not not exactly. I'm certainly secular and I was liberal all my life um, and I really hated George W. Bush. I thought he really was just destroying the country with bad policies. And as long as he was president, I, I had to um, I had to consider myself a liberal. But in writing the book – I, you know, I really tried to understand everybody from the inside, and and I really it's a very tried risky to read a lot strategy. of strategy. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess it, where, in terms of where it led me, yeah, I mean, it, it, le it led me to. Well, I, I realized I couldn't call myself a liberal anymore. I'm not a conservative. Um, I, my view, look, as a social psychologist who studies morality, I've come to believe the research, which is that. Um, Everybody is an expert on certain aspects of the moral domain, and that causes them to um, to go blind to what the other side is saying. And I realized, you know, I think liberals are right about a lot of important issues and and rising inequality and and um, uh, you know some some uh, sort of things we need to do to get a capitalist system to function humanely. So you know, I think they're right on a lot of important issues. 
But in doing the research, I came to see that, wow, conservatives, if, if your criterion is how to run a healthy society that actually leads to flourishing and well-being, actually conservatives and libertarians are right on a lot of things too. So now I consider myself a centrist um, who finds a lot of wisdom on all sides, but not much in the current Republican Party. Hey, well, we're going to come back to that maybe toward the end. And I think, you know, it's a, I raised the issue about your personal views, which usually are irrelevant in, in our conversations. But in this one, I, I think know, they're, they're somewhat, they are relevant. They're somewhat, they're somewhat important. But it raises an interesting issue, just as a side note, which is I find as I've tried to become more tolerant as I get older, I don't know if I've been successful, but we talk a lot on this program about how we have to be aware of our own tendencies to self-deceive. We have to be humble. It's a very Hayekian viewpoint that – we don't understand everything. There are limits to reason. One of the possible outcomes of that is that you lose faith in your principles because you start to realize, you know, the other guy, he's well-intentioned as well as I am. And I am i don't yeah. have a monopoly on truth. Uh, so yeah, that what, is true. reflect on that. You do lose that. faith in your principles. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I used to be – I spent the 80s being really angry at Reagan. I spent the 90s exulting in uh, Clinton and being angry at his enemies. I used to you know, be a sort of an average level of anger. And, and maybe it's just you know, get older as you get older. Of, as a partisan, yeah, that's right. Um, but you know, as you get older, as your testosterone levels drop, uh, uh, generally in the life course, one gets less angry with age, so I can't tell what it is. <laughs> but I, I have found myself not getting angry that much. I despair at the, at the gridlock and the ridiculousness of our political system. Um, but it is true that, that um, I am less confident in my principles and therefore I have less principled anger than I used to. Less now, self-righteousness. You know, that's right. That's right. Now, you know, I think if I was an activist, if I was a legislator, well, there are a lot of reasons why you might want that passion. But, you know, I'm a scientist. My job is to figure out what's right. And so I'm willing to make that trade off of having fewer passionate principles driving me. And actually, I feel like I can see more than I was able to five years ago. Uh, does that make you a relativist? I'm sure you get that charge sometimes. Yeah, I know I do, especially from the right. Um, I'm a relativist, so it's a little bit complicated, but uh, well, let's, Seems, let's by try the way, it. By the, way, by the way, that's a, that's usually used as a pejorative term. It, it could be viewed as a compliment, but it, it does yeah, have a pejorative yeah. ter, uh, sense to it. That's right. So I, I certainly am not a moral realist in that I don't think that there is some objective truth outside of humanity. You know, Earth is the third planet from the sun. That is what's called a non anthropocentric truth. If aliens come here from another galaxy, they will discover that Earth is the third planet from the sun. Um, but, uh, you know, um, males and men and women should have equal political rights. Well, is, is that an objective truth? I think that's a truth today, but I'm not, I'm not willing to say that our ancestors five and 10 and 50,000 years ago were wrong uh, when, you know, we, there was always a gendered division in which men handled the politics and women, women uh, would handle the, the home life. So I don't think that there are eternal moral truths truths that are true regardless of how we live. If that makes me a relativist, then I'm a relativist. Actually, here you go. I think of myself as an emergentist. Mm -hmm. I think that moral truths are actually like truths of the market. You know, is gold more valuable than silver? Well, you know, if aliens come here from another planet, they might not think so. But given the way we live and the way we trade, the value of gold emerges just as gender equality has emerged. And it is really true. It is a moral truth now that women should have equal political rights. So there you go. I'm an emergentist, just like you. But well, except I'm actually a little. I think isn't more that Hayekian? It is, but I'm more absolutist than you are in the following way. Okay, how so? How so? I, I don't. Um, I, I think people misunderstand spontaneous order in the in emergence okay. in the following way. I'm not suggesting you do, but maybe um, we'll find out. I think people tend to think uh, we tend to romanticize it. I do think there's something romantic and, and wondrous and marvelous about spontaneous order. But I also realize there are many emergent orders that are horrific and amoral or immoral. Mm, yeah. Slavery, say, in the 19th century, early – late 18th, early 19th century in America, even though that was an emergent phenomenon, no one designed it. No one said well, – in fact, the opposite. A lot of people tried to stop it from being part of the American fabric when we became a, a, a literal mm -hmm. nation. So it was an emergent, but it was awful. And I'm, I have no problem saying that, that the morality – that saw uh, African Americans as inferior was evil. Uh, so, right. in that sense, I'm not yep. a more I'm not a relativist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me uh, let's let's build on that. So, um, what I like to, the way I like to think about it is this: a relativist is someone who a cultural relativist would say, "Hey, if that's the way they do it, then it's okay." Uh, that's the first step, and I, I definitely would not say that's enough, and for the reasons that you said. The next step would be. Let's look at the people who appear to be victims in a society 
And uh, if they themselves think they're victims, that's enough of a reason for us to condemn it. So um, African slaves uh, did everything they could to flee. They hated it. They, uh, there was no reason to think that this was a legitimate moral order that they approved of. Same thing for Jews in Nazi Germany. Uh, but if we look at, 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 say, Muslim societies in which the women veil, well, sometimes, you know, I don't know enough about it, but it seems as though uh, that is not necessarily enforced uh, against their will. So uh, there could be multiple spontaneous, multiple emergent moral orders in which even the people that we think are victims endorse it, don't feel that they're victimized, and can articulate um, uh, justifications that are, don't seem crazy. Now, of course, there's issues of false consciousness and deception, but at any rate, I, I'm not I one who believes that – oh, go ahead. No, you're right. I think that's a great starting place. <laughs> I think looking at how the, the alleged victims actually feel seems to be to be the crucial – a crucial way to, to distinguish. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you say at one point – I th- say it a lot actually and I think it's a beautiful phrase uh, and I, this is a good point to to explain it. You say morality binds and blinds. Explain that. Yes. Uh, so I'm trying to – I mean the thing that really has motivated me in writing the book is trying to figure out this miracle of human civilization. Um, no other species on the planet can cooperate unless they're siblings. So the bees, ants, wasps, termites, and naked mole rats can all live in giant structures that they built together because they're all sisters or sisters and brothers. But humans develop this ability um, to work together in all kinds of ways with not just people who are not kin, but even with strangers. You and I have never met, but we're able to cooperate um, uh, and, and put on this podcast. We're just so good at this. How did that happen? Uh, and so I, you know, there are a lot, you know, we could look at language, we can look at all sorts of things that allowed us to interact, but what allowed us to actually trust each other and not, uh, not take advantage of each other and to reap the benefits of cooperation. Uh, and m- the story I tell in the book is that morality serves the, um, a variety of functions, but there's social functions, one of which is to bind groups together in ways so that they can cooperate to compete against other groups. And w- so what we gain in cohesion, we often lose in open-mindedness. Um, and you see this on Capitol Hill all the time. I mean, you know, one side, uh, you know, the, the mere fact that one side proposes something means the other side will suddenly do everything it can to show why that's wrong, even if that side had actually proposed the same idea 10 or 20 years earlier. Um, now, some of that is strategic and it's just, uh, uh, you know, kabuki theater. Um, but in general, uh, when you get a moralistic group, a group bound together by a certainty that it's right, they become blind, to, uh, closed off to contradictory evidence. And, you, you know, I've kind of made a little cottage industry of, of showing how that happens on the left. I mean, in the academic world where almost everybody is liberal, um, you know, I think in general we do a good job in the sciences, social sciences, but on the key issues where there are, are, are sacred moral values at stake, it's hard for us to think straight. Yeah, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about the role of reason. <clears throat> you have a um, – you say that intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second, and you yes. use the image of the rider and the elephant. Uh, explain that image and how you apply mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So from my first book, The, the Happiness Hypothesis, um, I, I tried I, – I was examining 10 ancient truths and the most basic psychological insight from around the world is that the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. <clears throat> Usually one of these parts is said to be reason or conscious reasoning or something like that, and the other is emotion or intuition, something like that. Uh, now, Plato gave us the metaphor that these two parts are – um, reason is the charioteer, and uh, the passions are the horses. And the charioteer, if he can control the horses, then you get a rational, reasonable person. And so a man should study philosophy and learn to control the passions. Well, that's a very optimistic view of reason, but I think the evidence just doesn't support it. Um, the evidence shows that people are – we automatically and effortlessly do motivated reasoning. We, we, we start with a conclusion and we think, how can I find evidence to support that conclusion? Research on – research has found that if you compare people who are really smart versus those who are less smart, the really smart people aren't more open-minded. They're not better at looking on both sides. What they're better at is finding ever more and better post hoc justifications. So basically, I concluded pretty early on that David Hume was right when he said that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions – and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Most of my career has basically been an experimental vindication of David Hume's arguments against those who are worshiping reasoning in the Platonic tradition. So talk about the writer and the elephant. 
so what I came to see in writing the, the first book <clears throat> is that we're, you know, the mind is divided like a rider on an elephant. And, you know, if you make New Year's resolutions, I mean, this came about when I was, say, in dating relationships. And I would resolve, oh, I, you know, I should break up with her. But I, I found myself powerless to do so. Um, and I just marveled at my, uh, what's the word, you know, my inability to make myself do what I thought I should do. Um, uh, there's a, what I, there's a line from Ovid. I see the right way and approve it. Alas, I follow the wrong. So individual reasoning, I think is not very powerful. Danny Kahneman talks about this as system two, the reasoning versus system one, the intuition. <clears throat> um, but all is not lost for reason. While individual reasoning is so flawed, while an individual rider is pretty poor at making uh, the elephant do what the rider wants, but if you put us together in groups in the right way so that we can correct each other's uh, motivated reasoning, human beings and human groups can actually end up producing pretty rational behavior. Uh, so this is my main debate with the rationalists. A lot of people accuse me of being an anti-rationalist who thinks that reason doesn't exist or doesn't matter. And I say, no, it's just individual reasoning is really, really unreliable, or rather it reliably plays the role of a lawyer or a press secretary. Um, but why science works so well is because while we can't disprove our own ideas, we're bad at that. Well, boy, are we good at disproving each other's ideas. So, you know, science ends up, uh, you know, being pretty rational, uh, even though it's made of individually flawed scientists. Yeah, Vernon Smith said something uh, similar on this program uh a few years back, he won the Nobel Prize with the same year that, that Danny Kahneman did, and they both were experimentalists. Uh, Kahneman emphasized the irrationality of the human mind, and what Vernon Smith's interested in is how markets uh, push irrational yeah. people into rational Perfect. decisions. Yeah, Perfect. I, I love it. Love yeah. it. Let's give that guy the Nobel Prize. Yeah, I do too, of course, uh, but again, I would be – I would like it given my ideology, so I have to be careful, but it is um, – there is no doubt that – Individuals don't make great decisions, and markets make pretty good ones. Uh, so that yeah, there's something that's going how on. Yeah, we there. aggregate that. That's right. The weaknesses cancel out. It's, well, I don't know if they cancel out, but something's going on. It's it's, it's actually I yeah. think a subject for um, a more thought, a different kind of research agenda than the experimental kind that that experimentalists do in labs to think about how that process works. I don't know if anyone's uh, written very successfully on that. I think it's a, be a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> let's um, let's talk about. Your metaphor of our individualism versus our social side, uh, you just mentioned that, uh, how we work well in groups. And of course, sometimes we work well in groups to hurt other groups. Uh, sometimes we work well in groups to create beautiful, extraordinary yeah. things like a symphony uh, a performance. But you use the – you say humans are 90 percent chimp and 10 percent bee. Uh, first, say mm -hmm. what you mean by that. And my question, which I don't think you talk about much in the book, is – where do you get those numbers from? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. So so first the metaphor. Well, the easy part is the numbers I just made up as being approximate. Yeah, I, just I wanna, understand. It's I, not, it's not yeah, 90.3 but, but, okay, but the, 9 yeah, but, but, but Yeah. So what is it, right? So what does it mean? So um, uh, so there's so much written on the evolution of morality. And this, this especially started in the 60s. Uh, so Darwin was really concerned about the evolution of morality because here he was talking about the importance of competition – and why is it that animals sometimes cooperate? And why, what about humans? Morality seemed to be something of a challenge for his theory. So he had a lot of really good ideas about it, um, but one of which was that uh, sometimes um, a virtue might put one at a disadvantage relative to your peers. But if it helps the whole group and your group is competing with other groups, uh, then uh, this virtue can spread in that way because your group is more successful. So this was known as group selection. And Darwin thought that perhaps as one of several processes, uh, human morality uh, was a result of group selection as tribes vied with other tribes. And lots of people love this idea uh, that we are born to be cooperative. Um, but uh, it was applied in very woolly-headed ways. And in the 1960s, George Williams basically demolished the idea um, and showed, if you just do the very simple mathematical models, that any sort of genetic basis for being altruistic uh, might help your group. But if there's a selfish person in the next uh, tent over from you, that person will on average have more children than you and the genes for it will disappear. So that became dogma. Richard Dawkins really developed the idea further in the selfish gene. That idea really became dogma, no group selection. There is no group selection. Um, and so for 30 years, all anyone talked about was reciprocal altruism, uh, which is you can easily show, and Darwin is, uh, suggested this, you can easily show how 
we can't evolve to be uniformly nice, but boy, if we can recognize who's likely to return the favor, it is adaptive to, to be nice to that person. So reciprocal altruism and kin selection. For 30 years, that's all anyone ever wrote about. It got so boring. I couldn't stand to read these, these analyses and books in, this, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and and uh, in the 90s, uh, then this guy, David Sloan Wilson at, at uh, Binghamton University, had been arguing all along that, no, no, you know, the models actually work for humans, because as long as you have a way of stamping out free riding and punishing cheaters, um, actually you can get group selection models working well. And I read his book, Darwin's Cathedral, and I thought it, found it very, very persuasive. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that if you're, if you're just thinking about morality as altruism, you don't need group selection. But if you expand the moral domain as I did, and you're interested in group loyalty and respect for authority and the idea of making things sacred, Boy, these things don't make a lot of sense from reciprocal altruism, but they make perfect sense if you think about tribes competing with other tribes. And if you think, as Darwin did, that group cohesion matters when you have intergroup competition. So what I'm saying here is that almost all human nature can be explained without group selection. We are 90% chimp. What, and chimps are not really group selected. So, um, you know, as Franz de Waal says, all the building blocks of human morality can be found in, ch in chimps. And I think almost all can. So that's the 90% chimp. Uh, but I think that uh, beginning with Homo heidelbergensis w around 800,000 years ago, uh, beginning with that species, which was the first to uh, tame fire, have campsites, hunt large game, cooperatively bring it back to the campsite, butcher it. Well, this group probably also, uh, they had spears. They probably also were engaged in intergroup conflict. And it's this species uh, that also begins to have cumulative cultural evolutions, the first signs of culture building on previous innovations. So that, I think, was our Rubicon, um, Homo heidelbergensis, 800 to 500,000 years ago. So that opens up the possibility of true uh, group selection aided by gene culture co-evolution. Now, bees are group selected. A bee doesn't live or die based on its ability to outcompete another bee. Bees live and die based on the hive's ability to prevail over other hives. So that's what I mean by we're 10% bee. We have a short period, maybe just a couple hundred thousand years, in which I believe there was group selection, adding a kind of a group selected overlay to our older human nature. And this is crucial for understanding not just war and genocide and all the ugly stuff, uh, but patriotism, nation building, uh, local pride, uh, sports, um, our ability to form companies, corporations. A corporation is, in law and in practice, a body composed of other bodies. So I think the evidence is all around us that we're groupish. And that's what I was trying to capture in that metaphor. Uh, we are 10% B. We have a little bit in common with Bs because we went through a group selection process. Yeah, I, I, I'm deeply uh uh, in agreement with that, I think in particular, it's, it's one of the things I think libertarians uh, sometimes miss, which is our desire to be part of something larger than ourself. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. I think the left romanticizes, say, our democracy or our political process and takes away some of the realities of it to make it look more appealing than it actually is. But I think libertarians have no ability, almost no ability to even appreciate the idea of the body politic or collective decision making. And I understand the harm of it and the dangers of it. But it seems to be an important part of our humanity in lots of ways. And for some exactly. people, some people being uh, their political persuasion is their religion. For other people, their sports is their religion. And for some folks, their literal religion is their religion. But let's talk about let's talk about that. Talk about I like your UVA, um, University of Virginia. Oh, yeah. Saturday uh -huh. afternoon uh, religious experience. So talk about that and talk about how sports and religion and all these things have many uh -huh. things in common. Yeah, that's what I found so exciting. So in part three of the book, so just to make the structure of the book clear, um, the first part of the book is about the idea that intuition comes first, strategic reasoning second, and, and you and I already talked about that. The middle part of the book is based on the idea that there's more to morality than harm and fairness, and that's all the, the moral taste buds, the moral foundations. The third part of the book is based on the idea, the meta, the idea that morality binds and blinds. And it's because I saw so much the same behavior. If you, if you read about initiation rites in non-Western societies and what it takes to, to turn a boy into a man and make him feel part of his part of the group and uh, you know, a warrior who will defend the tribe's honor. And you look at what gangs do in the inner cities, same stuff. Uh, you look at the rituals, that cult, the, the way cults work to incorporate people, same stuff. You look at what a lot of religions do, a lot of sports teams do. Now, you know, those, they're doing more. It's, they're, those are more complicated. Um, but it's, it's all, there are all these different ways of achieving the same end, which is changing a person from an individual to a group member. 
Um, I'm very ungroupish. Um, I'm I'm an, you know sort of rational atheist. I identified more with Spock than with Kirk growing up watching Star Trek. Um, but you know at least as a scholar and a, a social scientist, I see all this stuff, and you know and I felt it at at, at times. Um, so you know I just I began studying it in that way, and and I think your point about libertarians, I mean that's what I found in my research on the different psychological types. Libertarians are the most individualistic, the least emotional, the least sociable. Um, they're the most rational. They're the smartest. Um, so just it sounds like if you lean libertarian and if you recognize that portrait of libertarian, it sounds like you at least can rationally recognize that most people are really groupish, even if you're not. Uh, and so you know that's kind of what I'm I'm trying to do in this part of the book is is appeal to everybody to just explain the sort of the bizarreness of our species. Um, I mean, my God, you look at sports games, you look at, you know, people going to football games in the sub-zero weather, painting their faces and taking their shirts off. I mean, by any rational calculation of utility, it's crazy unless you realize that we are 10 percent B. Yeah, and I think um, I think libertarians have handicapped themselves tremendously by failing to realize that most people aren't like us. Uh, that right. Most people are groupish. Most people are emotional. They don't want an analytical argument. Most people don't. They want an argument that appeals to the heart and they want to feel part of something. So the libertarian right. – you know, obviously there are many different strands of libertarianism, but I, I think the worst strand is the one that's totally individualistic and totally analytical and that appeals powerfully to a, a analytical individualist. And, and then they can't understand why no one wants to go with them and the answer is because yeah. you've made it unattractive. Well, here, I think we should bring in the idea of stories and narrative. And I know you've written two two books that uh, that, that try to get at this. So I, I want to first ask you, why did you write your books? Was it because you recognized this this problem? Yeah, uh, that's part of it. Now, I, I've, I've written actually three novels. Uh, they're all designed to touch the heart because I think that's the overwhelming way that most people accept or adopt ideas. And if we only, as people of freedom, people who care about liberty, only couch ideas in in blackboard graphs and charts, we lose. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That, that's right. And here I would also bring in Arthur Brooks, president of American Enterprise. He's trying to he's do the been, same thing. Yeah. He's trying to do the same thing for conservatives, exactly. That's right, that the arguments for the free market system can't be about productivity and graphs. They Getting have to rich. be. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, that's right. They have to be that actually the, you know, that markets end up uh, solving poverty. Mar market, I mean, markets end up helping people. Markets end up um, uh, doing things that, that even that uh, people on the left would, would approve of. You, you, as we've talked about, are sympathetic, at least in concept to conservatives uh, and in certain mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. Uh, but what I've noticed, and this goes back – I'm going to lump conservatives and libertarians together. Obviously, in many ways, they don't belong together, but many areas, in many areas, they do overlap. They overlap in certainly in economic uh, policy. Right. Ten, they, excuse yeah. me. They tend to. Uh, yeah. I think there is a problem with the pro-business wing of of the conservative movement, which the libertarians uh, totally reject. But let's put that put that to the side. Mm -hmm. In uh, in two thousand and one, James Buchanan wrote a rather extraordinary uh, Nobel laureate. Uh, James Buchanan wrote an extraordinary op-ed in the Wall Street Journal where he said that that classical liberalism. And by that, he meant a whole bunch of things. But one of the things that includes is free market policies uh, has lost the moral high ground. And mm -hmm. you suggest in the book implicitly that that because of these different moral centers that we have in our brain, that in many ways conservatives and you could argue libertarians who are free market oriented have an advantage because they've got all these additional uh, arguments. But I agree with Buchanan. I think the free market viewpoint has lost a lot of its moral fiber, has trouble making a moral case to skeptics and independents. Mm -hmm. And we see this today when Republicans are trying to stop, say, unemployment benefits from being extended for I think I think they've been in place for five years instead of the normal 39 weeks. But Republicans cannot make a moral case and therefore they're going to they're going to vote to extend it, which they've done so far. Mm -hmm. uh, what's right. going on there? Right. Um, well, I don't know that I don't know that free market ideology has lost the the moral high ground. In that the evidence of history, which was ambiguous in the 20th century um, and which looked pretty bad in the 30s for free market uh, policies, um, uh, obviously scored a big win with the fall of communism. But what I'm seeing here, I am in a business school. What I'm seeing is. Um, the incredible rise of India and China and so many other countries, which has led to the rapid fall of poverty. I mean, 
this is the biggest one of the biggest events in human history is poverty rates are plummeting around the world yep. uh, because whenever a nation turns towards free markets, bang, their poverty level drops. I mean, maybe there are exceptions here and there, but in general, uh, and when they, uh, you know, um, so I think that free market uh, uh, policies have, in a sense, won on the global scale. Now, I think what's happening is that um, there are so many different forms of capitalism which vary in their corruption. Um, efficient markets are wonderful things, uh, but uh, um, uh, business leaders, uh, uh, government officials, there's so much to be gained by warping markets and taking kickbacks, bribes, rents. So to the extent that uh, free market societies in practice are corrupted, then it, it triggers outrage. It triggers the Fairness Foundation that these guys are cheating. It triggers the Liberty Oppression Foundation and that these guys are bullying us. Um, so I spent a little time at Occupy Wall Street when I, I arrived at NYU. I, I moved here in 2011 just as um, Occupy Wall Street was starting. Um, and you know, there's a lot to hate about a system that overall is the only system that actually generates wealth and leads to good societies. So that's the conundrum. And I think that if, if, there were, if the free market folks were less ideological, and as I said, morality binds and blinds. If they would say, markets are wonderful things, but when left to their own devices, you can bet that there's going to be monopoly, there's going to be distortions of information, there's going to be all kinds of terrible externalities foisted on the environment and the poor and all and animals. So, you know, if the free market types would be less sort of, uh, you know, worshipping of Milton Friedman and, and a little more focus on how do we get markets to actually be efficient, um, I think they would regain the high ground pretty quickly. I totally disagree with that, but that's that's a long. That's a long <laughs> okay. No, that's please, a, no, no. Tell me. No, tell me where I'm wrong because I'm just trying these ideas out. Again, yeah. I'm new in a business school. I'm I'm, I'm especially inter- I, I'm I've 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 sort of swallowed the the Kool Aid on the power of markets, uh, but I want to be convinced that uh, they can actually deliver in ways that that are not exploitative. Well, I think the big question is when you try to fix them using the not so healthy, not so perfect political system. What he end up with would seem to matter, and that, right. I, w- I want to push us in that direction. Which is, okay. it seems to me, and, and I want your psychologist hat now. It seems to me that people care a lot about appearances rather than reality in policy yeah. areas. So, let's take yeah. the, the minimum wage. The minimum wage, I believe, is overwhelmingly bad for for poor people. And I could be wrong. I'm, I'm totally willing to accept the possibility that the empirical evidence is 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 otherwise. I, I happen to know something about that empirical evidence and how hard it is to actually tease out Mm -hmm. the independent effect. But a lot of economists have come to the view, which is very different than it used to be, that the minimum wage is a good idea and we ought to increase it. I think they're wrong, but but a lot of people feel that way. Yep. And 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 they've got quote evidence to support it, but it's not it's not very good evidence, and and it's not very good evidence on my side either. By the way, I don't want to suggest that I've got the good evidence. They've mm-hmm. got the bad evidence. I don't think that's mm-hmm. that's true. But but my point is that let me take a better example: education. If you ask people in a survey, should we spend more on education? I, the, a lot of people say yes. That the fact yeah. that it's the, the answer is independent of how much we already spend. It's independent yeah, of what the right. impact has been. It, yeah, it's what just the that, well, costs are. Right, yep, I want to look, and, right. and a lot of it is. I, Forget. Let's just talk about social circles. I don't want to be one of those people who doesn't like children. And, I, and my answer exactly. is always, well, I like children. That's why I don't want to spend more on education. It's not working. It's hurting children. We've lost a generation of children in the Americans – two generations now of kids in the American inner city through, through this top-down education system. But they say, yep. well, we just need to spend more. And so yep. the, the moral high ground, my side, which wants decentralized education, which is something of a crapshoot because we've – it looks mm-hmm. scary and uncertain. The other side just yep. says, what, you, you don't like the children? So it seems to me a lot of yeah. our debate on the left-right axis or the free market top-down versus bottom-up axis, we lose, those of us who want less government, more mm-hmm. bottom-up, because we can't mm-hmm. make a – we can't in general make a very convincing moral case. Do you think that's true? Absolutely. Um, this is – so um, – we we reason not to find the truth. We reason to find arguments that we like. We reason to uh, defend our reputation. Um, um, so in general, we you know we're like a public relations firm. We are much more concerned with reality. Uh, I'm sorry, with appearance than with reality. And this is the big problem with voting. Uh, you know, people always wonder, well, why do people vote against their self-interest? Answer. Your vote, no matter which way you vote, it doesn't affect your self-interest unless the election is won by a single vote. Voting is expressive. It's an expressive act. And if you vote for more welfare or more school spending, you are saying you're a compassionate person in some I'm a good guy. So, yeah. So, um, 
So voting policy, and this is like even with the minimum wage. I mean, I can't see any argument, whatever you think of the minimum wage, I can't see any argument against indexing it for inflation, but apparently legislators never do because they want the credit. When they raise the minimum wage, they want the credit for it. Uh, So this is the problem, and you're right to say that the political system is so inept, and it's in part because even more than normal life, politicians live and die by appearances, not by reality. There is no feedback mechanism by which a bad policy will lead to a person or a party being kicked out. It's just, you know, the the, the delays are so long, the, the complexities are such. So the political system doesn't evolve. Policy doesn't evolve. In the biological world, uh, innovations that are maladaptive fade out. In the business world, innovations that don't bring in more customers fade out. In the policy and politics world, there is no corrective mechanism. There's no evolution. There's uh, some. This is a disaster there's for us. Some. There's, there's some. Okay, there's some. You're right, there's some. But it's pretty poor. And this is, you know, where at least... Uh, um, in a parliamentary system, at least one party, you've got responsible party government. So, you know, a party's in control. If things aren't working out, you punish the party. But when we have divided government, nobody knows whose fault it is. Yeah. Well, let's turn to economists. Um, economists use uh, moral reasoning just like everybody else. Uh, talk about your work in that area. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, again, now that I'm in a business school and I'm beginning to shift my research away from politics and more towards, uh, towards business and business ethics – um, so just for example, I read uh, – there was a, an interesting uh, um, essay by uh, uh, Paul Krugman last year in which he argued that the Austerians – actually, I have a quote from him right here. Uh, the Austerians, the people who favor austerity, they tend to be conservative. Um, he said some powerful people have a visceral sense that suffering is good, that we must pay a price for past sins. And I thought that made sense, and I looked at our data set from yourmorals.org, and what I found – I found – you've got this great question in there um, – Here, we had on a question uh, measuring the Protestant work ethic, we had an item, life would have very little meaning if we never had to suffer. Well, it turns out liberals generally say no, I disagree with that, and conservatives say yes. Um, Another one is the world would be a better place, let me find the exact wording of it here. Uh, The world would be a better place if we let unsuccessful people fail and suffer the consequences. A really steep slope on that one. Liberals say definitely no, and conservatives say definitely yes. So if you think about economists, who are thinking about austerity. What's the proper response to a fiscal meltdown? And if you have this sort of Protestant work ethic, uh, you know, a binge should be followed by a purge, you're going to look for the data that supports austerity. Austerity policies are going to be pleasing. It's the punishment after the sin. And you'll find it because as long as there's ambiguity, you'll find the evidence you, you want. Whereas liberals are focused on the poor. They're focused on the, the greedy bastards at the top who made off with all the gains. They left the poor holding the bag. They're going to look for the evidence that austerity doesn't work. Now, I happen to think that Krugman is right on this. I happen to think that austerity is a foolish policy um, in the wake of a – but again, I'm not an economist. What do I know? All I'm saying is that everybody, left, right, libertarian, when they approach an ambiguous field of contradictory findings, they start with their own moral intuitions. Those guide them to prefer certain conclusions. They look for the evidence that those conclusions are right. They always find that evidence, and this is why what, – what's the famous saying? If you laid a, uh, economists end to end, you wouldn't reach a conclusion. Um, this is why you, you can't get closure on some pretty basic empirical claims in, in economics if they are ideologically laden. Would you agree well, with that claim? Well, I think it's worse than that, <clears throat> actually. I, I, I think it's – because we deal in a multi-causal world and because the economy is complex, because there's an infinite number of things to change at the same time, uh, as you say, you can always cherry-pick the data in a way. You can always yep. tell us a, an, an ex post ad hoc story and left and economists on the left and the right are really good at that. And, um, yep, that's what I'm saying. And, that's but, what... but you're saying something stronger than that, which is which side you pick – to, to align with is based on your moral principles, not your scientific understanding. It's not just that there's two different sides. It's that people line up with sides that they're already preconditioned to to line up with. Yeah, that's right. That's the whole point of the heritability piece of my story. So let's just take let's take the case of say compassion. Some kids. Are like if they see animal cruelty, it, it just is so painful for them. They're they're really affected by cruelty. Other kids, you know, they'll you know swing cats into trees. Um, now, if you are if you are um, if if compassion is incredibly powerful in you, you will resonate more towards leftist arguments about the poor than you will uh, towards libertarian arguments, say about the importance of competition or individualism or whatever. Um, similarly. 
Some people are very low on disgust sensitivity. Other people are very high on it. Um, if you tend to see or feel that certain things are contaminated, others are sacred, you'll respond more to um, arguments about sacredness and to some religious practices, say in Judaism or Catholicism, um, that treat certain things as sacred or off limits. So what I'm saying is that, uh, as we know, every aspect of personality is heritable. Identical twins reared apart tend to be similar. So as those identical twins uh, grow up in different families and are exposed to political arguments once they reach college, let's say, uh, they will gravitate to the ones that resonate with their innate personality. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, economics as a field, it's, once it became so mathematical, it began to attract more high systemizers, probably more people with Asperger's. So economics is going to attract uh, you know, more people who are very rational, very high systemizers, relatively low on empathy. To be fair to Paul Krugman, he, um, he argues relentlessly that, that uh, he's just a scientist and um, it's the other folks who have these biases. But I, I actually suspect – I, that both yeah. sides have these biases. Uh, being an Austerian myself, and um, uh -oh. having uh, and admitting to my bias, and and I can uh, certainly make the case that the stimulus didn't work very well. But Paul seems to make the case easily on the other side. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I think Paul. You know, Paul is quite a passionate partisan. So you know, while I think he's a good economist, uh, nobody is just a good. Well, well I shouldn't say nobody. Uh, certainly, yeah, someone as passionate as he yeah. can be, just an open-minded <laughs> scientist. It's hard. It's 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 it's, it's difficult. Hard. And having said that, however, I, I do believe that there are historic episodes that add to knowledge in economics. I don't think it's all. Oh, it's whatever okay. you want it to say, and the the numbers don't tell us anything. I think there are some uh, episodes in, in economic history where people do learn things that a consensus does build around, even on left and right. Uh, just to pick one we've mentioned before, what causes inflation? A lot of people say it's it's increase in the money supply. Though having said that. Um, we do have a time now where there is an increase in the mind supply without inflation. Uh, people debate about why that is, but it's been – what is true yeah, – Because the world's multifactorial, yeah, multi-causal. But, it's, yeah. but yeah. what is true is there – I don't think there are very many, if it, if any, episodes of inflation without a money supply increase. It's not the same thing. It's, but that point I mm -hmm. think is, is correct. Um, and I do want to encourage – I'll put a link up to it uh, over at EconLog, this, the sister uh, blog of Econ Talk. At the Library of Economics and Liberty, Scott Sumner has been chronicling some of the uh, recent statements by some economists claiming to predict the effects of monetarism or stimulus. And th there's been some – there's some pretty strong evidence. It's not – it's never conclusive though and that's why there's always a chance <laughs> to tell a story later. Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, how has the academic community taken your work? I have two more questions. This is the first one. Mm -hmm. How, how sure. academic you, – you've got a very successful non-academic book that usually makes mm -hmm. academic folks uh, annoyed uh, and they tend to disparage it because it's obviously uh, tawdry to do such – to be successful. But uh, how, is, how has your book been received by the academic community? Mm -hmm. So I think what you say about how academics would look down on popular trade books, I think that was very true up until the 90s. Um, but I think especially in the social sciences, um, there have been so many good trade books, starting with Steve Pinker and, and E.O. Wilson and, and the, um, the literary agent John Brockman brings a lot of these out. Um, I, I found that actually my academic colleagues have liked both of my books. And I, I don't think I've lost any credibility for, for speaking to a broad audience or writing trade books. Um, on the, in part, my, my recent book was a sort of riding the giant wave of findings from neuroscience and primatology about the importance of intuition and, emo and emotion and evolution. So in part, um, the, the Righteous Mind is really just chronicling major trends. So in that sense, I'm still very much, you know, uh, I'm, I'm part of the movement and, and uh, I don't think I'm seen as a, as a rebel or, or a crazy person. But your former, um, your former colleague, Brian Nezick, was a guest on Econ Talk, um, and he has, along with others, have been working on the credibility and replicability of, of psychological experiments. Yes. Um, you say you're riding a wave of findings. Uh, do you think they'll stand up? Yeah, so we have a huge problem in psychology, which turns out to be common to most of the sciences and uh, the social sciences and medicine, um, which is that the publication process um, makes it very easy for people to get results that are not replicable, that are false, that are spurious, but that you can still get just if you just vary things enough and you do and enough you studies tor and you, you torture the data until it confesses, as we yeah. say. Yeah. So Brian is doing fantastic work holding our feet to the fire and saying we've got to up our game. Just something as simple – look at it this way. Um, 
something as simple as posting your data online is going to stop people from doing the shenanigans. It's common practice in my field and in many others to try lots of different statistical tests until you get one that works. And you can justify that. Of course, you can justify almost anything when there's ambiguity. So Brian is saying, you know, and others are saying, no, let's post our data online. And that way, you'll be held accountable and responsible. So that would be a big, big improvement. Um, so that's one problem. Um, I've been calling attention to another problem, which is that because there are essentially no conservatives in social psychology, I have only been able to find one. Um, um, so this means that uh, our, our science, our tendency, our need for those to take the other side of a bet, for those to challenge uh, confirmation bias, um, it, it breaks down on ideological matters, especially race and gender. So we have a problem there too. We have a few problems in, in this, it, well, they're, they're common to the sciences, um, especially the social sciences and especially social psychology. We have several problems, but I think it is ultimately self-corrective um, after scandals. We've had a number of scandals of people who actually just made up data. And so this is part of what has, uh, has given people like Brian um, uh, both the, the, the push to do something about it and the respect. To, it's painful. What Brian is asking us to do is going to be difficult. It's going to be harder. Um, but I think we are learning. We are going to improve um, our standards and produce better science as we go forth. Last question. Do you worry your book will be used by political players to shape messages that move us further apart politically? I know you you make a strong plea for bipartisanship mm -hmm. in, at the end of the book and, and how we – just humanity. Mm -hmm. It's good to try to understand our fellows and the people who don't agree with us are human beings. They actually are good motivation mm -hmm. sometimes. But political players, it's a blood sport. Um, your insights into the human brain, do you think there's mm -hmm. a temptation to use them for purposes oh, you're not, sir? Yeah. Oh, my god. Yeah, I know. You know, I've – um, I, uh, one of my former students worked in the Obama campaign. He said he saw copies of the book around the, the political headquarters. Um, uh, liberal commentators on the web will say, oh, you should read this book. It'll, t it'll tell you how to speak to conservatives. Um, so I know it's being used that way on the left. And that's – it was really part of my original impetus for writing the book was back when I was a partisan liberal, I wanted the left to win. Um, so I know the book is being used on the left. I believe it's being used on the right as well. Uh, but I'm encouraged at least that readers who are not active in politics, um, readers from what they write on Amazon and elsewhere, uh, really are having the kind of experience that I myself had from looking at both sides and that my students and my classes have, which is, hey, wow, you know, this it, it doesn't change my politics, but man, I, I, don't, I see that they're not as stupid and crazy as I thought. And so I'm very encouraged by the, by the general reaction that most readers are having. My guest today has been Jonathan Haidt. He is the author of The Righteous Mind. Jonathan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. My pleasure, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.